I'm going to focus on um, three things, and that's really what I'm going to talk about. Uh, the first, which was asked by Monica Jones, was to talk a little bit about the differences in hemispherectomy. Uh, she wanted to, she felt it was important for families so that you understand that there's not just one hemispherectomy, there's different types, uh, and that you need to understand what some of those different variabilities are. Linked with that is the question about the type of hemispherectomy versus the possibility for um, seizure recurrence after an initial successful surgery. So that'll be topic two. And the third one, which was requested by uh, Rachel Kogel, was a little bit of an understanding of the variety of the etiologies and what sort of the, what you expect in a population. So I'm gonna, those are the three topics. And for, for those of you who want orientation, um, especially in the summertime, LA is best viewed at night. In this case, from a long distance, like from the space shuttle. Um, <laughs> And so, so you can get oriented here. This is what, so you can pull this down from NASA so you can see what it is. So they've labeled the important sites. So there's Disneyland, um, LAX, uh, UCLA. You'll notice that USC is not mentioned here. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna talk about that. So again, the sort of three goals I wanna do to this morning real briefly is talk about the different types. Uh, the role of residual tissue and uh, about recurrence of seizures, which is a developing area, and then the common and more unusual forms of etiologies. Okay, so my MRI, this is a traditional classic anatomic hemispherectomy. Uh, the original hemispherectomy was not done for epilepsy. It was actually done for tumors by a man named, man named Dandy in the late 20s. Uh, the first reported series of hemispherectomies for seizure control was by a South African by the name of Cranow, and that was published in the uh, early 50s. His patients were primarily adult patients who had suffered, the chil as children had had perinatal infarcts, and had suffered seizures for many, many years. But this sort of showed that the possibility of doing hemispherectomy for epilepsy uh, in mostly individuals who had these atrophic or strokes. And so by 1970, there was about 400 cases uh, reported in the literature by, it was reviewed by Wilson et al. doing this traditional classic anatomic hemispherectomy where basically the craniotomy goes all the way to the top and all the way to the front and back and you took everything out. The issue that showed up in the late 70s and early 80s was this condition called superficial hemosiderosis, so our chronic blood membranes that were in these, uh, in, in these cases. And about one-third of the cases developed this, and of those cases that developed it, one-third died from the superficial hemosiderosis. Uh, this was before the era of doing this in children. So there was a attempt at that point to see if you could change how to do the operation. And the person that had the greatest influence on that was a man named Theodore Rasmussen, for which Rasmussen encephalitis was also co-named. He was the neurosurgeon in Montreal. And he made the observation that if you took out multilobar resections, you never saw the superficial hemosiderosis. And there was no need to take the whole piece of tissue out all the brain out. So he said, can you do something in which you take out parts and disconnect the rest? And he devised what's referred to either as the Rasmussen's functional style or it's just called a functional hemispherectomy and this was first described in 83. And by MRI it looks something like this. So there's some tissue still left in the front, there's some tissue still left in the back, and there's this big chunk of tissue taken out here on the temporal lobe. Uh, with this big area here of the insular still left behind. But this was referred to as a functional hemispherectomy. Everything else since then that uses the term functional hemispherotomy, whatever term you want to use, is a variation on this concept. The concept is take out parts, disconnect the rest. Okay? That's everything else since. What are those variations? All right? Well, uh, Villemur from Montreal, followed then by uh, Johannes Schramm from Germany, uh, both have descriptions of what referred to as a lateral approach, where you basically open, go through with what we call the Sylvian fissure, and get a highway here and a highway here to disconnect from within the ventricle, still leaving a fair amount of tissue here and the insular still behind. 
And then in the, the 90s, uh, Olivier de Lalande from uh, Paris, some of which who, I think there's one person here who actually knows him because he's had sur that did surgery on them, devised something what he referred to as a vertical hemispher hemispherectomy. And this is a slide actually from his collection. He had learned how to do this primarily by doing callosotomies. That's what he was familiar with. And that's one of the themes here is that the surgeon usually takes up the technique for which they've trained or they've learned mostly about. And so the secret here is he takes out a bit of window here in the frontal area and then goes through those deeper structures to disconnect, leaving a fair amount behind. But, but this is a little bit more disconnected. Uh, this is what's called, referred to as the Winston procedure. This is the procedure that um, has been the one that uh, ben, uh, ben Carson and the Hopkins group has usually followed. The d original description of the Winston procedure was to go into the cortex and follow the subcortical white matter uh, until you got to what this area called the cingulate. And in theory, it was supposed to leave the uh, ventricular system intact. This was supposed to be some way of then preventing the superficial hemosiderosis. It's taken me a few years, but I've finally gotten a scan for one of these types of procedures post-op. And as you can see, the ventricular system is actually quite, is, is, is partly taken in this. Uh, so, but this is again a variation. You can see that there's tissue in the front and back taken, uh, still leaving a fair amount here. Now Ben, I know, does take some of this stuff. Uh, so when you, when you talk about the Winston procedure, you would leave it behind, but if you actually take it, that's another variation on that theme. Um, the procedure that I sort of devised at UCLA about a decade ago now, or a little bit more, is also a variation on this. In our experience, when I look back, the cases that we had had real problems with as far as late surgeries were the functional Rasmussen-style hemispherectomy where a significant amount of the deeper structures were retained. And so what I wanted to do was to devise something where we took the deeper structures but reduced the amount of tissue and hopefully reduced the size of the craniotomy so we could reduce the blood loss. And we were able to show that with a smaller craniotomy we could do this. Acknowledging that, understanding the following. We t you know, this, the, if you do a standard anatomic hemispherectomy or functional hemispherectomy, you're talking usually in the range of 800 to 1,000 cc blood loss. That's a lot of blood. For an adult, you can get away with that. However, if you're dealing with a six kilogram child who has about 350 cc's of total blood volume, you can begin to understand the risk. Now, the operation that I do can take the blood loss down to about the 350, 400 cc range. That's still a whole body transfusion for a very small child. But it's not three to four times the blood volume like you would have to do if you were doing the other procedures. So people say, why don't you just do an anatomic hemispherectomy? And the reason is it depends upon the etiology and the size of the child. The smaller the child, the more dysplastic the cortex, then the greater the risk for blood loss. And so trying to reduce that risks is really the key that, that in my mind. So you're trying to reduce those risks. So these are the different variations. Um, what about residual tissue? And this is controversial. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be quite frank about this. If we, you, when we were in the November meeting in the Netherlands, and talking to the surgeons, there was a wide variety of opinions. There's a lot of people who, who claim that uh, leaving a little bit behind has no bearing. I don't believe that because of our own experience. And this is just one example of that. This is one of our kids. And I operated and we got seizure control for about 18 months, two years. And then the seizures recurred. They're very difficult to isolate because, the, there's, as you can see, there's, no, there's a lot of space. So the scalp EEG doesn't show you a whole lot. On imaging, there is just this, here's my cut, right here. So I left this piece behind, and I left it behind because I'm very close to areas of the hypothalamus and other areas, and the idea is, well, I should be able to leave that behind and get away with it. Uh-uh. So we went back, and I've just seen this child now a year out, uh, and so you can see I took out that little extra bit, and that was enough to make this person seizure-free. This was no more than two centimeters by about a centimeter and a half. Pathology confirmed a very severe cortical dysplasia. And so what I can tell you is, I mean, the only connection is that connection right there. That's all it took. 
So uh, in my experience, if you, if you get kids back far enough and you watch them, there are a number who have recurrent seizures after being seizure-free. And the first two questions we ask is, did they develop delayed hydrocephalus? Because that can set people's seizures off. And second, is there something still connected? And when you talk about the something still connected, uh, it can be pretty difficult. Um, as Henry Jones will be the best example, it took three shots before it was done. So it can be, in some circumstances, connections that are not even possible to be seen clearly by imaging. So we come back to the basis of what Dr. Shields talked about. The purpose here is to try to get your children to the best developmental stage. The p way to do that is to make them seizure free. If you, and if you've got residual seizures, let's hunt and hunt and hunt until we can get them taken care of. That's the message I would give across. Now as far as the etiologies are concerned, I'll try to get through this relatively quickly. Uh, there's two data sources I'll talk about. One of my other hats that I wear is I work with the International League Against Epilepsy, that's the ILAE, and we have did this survey uh, for calendar year 2004 trying to get as many pediatric epilepsy surgery centers from around the world to contribute and pool data for that, for that year. So this is self-reported data, it's not audited, so you have to take it for the grain of salt, but you can see that we collected from 46 centers, from 21 countries, over 1,100 patients, and you can see we distributed all over the place except Africa where we couldn't find a program that was actually working too well. The important point out of this for hemispherectomy is as follows. Out of the number of, of resections, about 20% were hemispherectomies. Of the 46 centers, 36 reported doing this operation. So not every center that called themselves a pediatric center were doing hemispherectomies. And then the number of cases per center is shown here, from 1 up to 20. And the 20 was not in North America or in Europe. It was in Asia, of all places. Uh, but you can see here that the median was about 4 per year. And in this series, 5 centers, or only about 10% of all of them, contributed 50 or 50% 50 of the cases that were done. So generally speaking, there's a few places that do a lot of it, and there's a number of places that don't do as many of it, and then there's a lot of centers that don't do it at all. All right? And this is from around the world. If you look at the age at the surgery, about a third or more were in, under age two years. This is typical for this. And if you were to sort of go back and say, of kids having surgery in the first two years of life, somewhere depending on the center, 60 to 80 percent of the operations will be hemispherectomies. These are the smallest kids with the highest risk profile. So in general, this is an operation that for most circumstances occurs in the youngest kids um, and that because you know, they are born with, born with the big bad brains. If you look, as again, as a percentage, about 60%. Now, as far as etiologies are concerned, and here you have to kind of spend how you want to split or combine. Etiologies such as stroke or infections, post that, that kind of stuff where there's an atrophic etiology, uh, it constitute about 30%. Cortical dysplasia, not hemimeg specifically, would be the next group, while hemimegencephaly, and this is from the 2004 surveys, next. If you combine the two dysplastic etiologies, which is cortical dysplasia and hemimeg, it equals almost half. So and if I look, think if you look around this room and if you look at the people with their etiologies, you'll find that about half are some sort of cortical dysgenesis. Rasmussen's is the next one, but falls down on the, on, on the list. Sturge-Weber tuberous sclerosis, and a couple cases that, were, that didn't have much in the way of etiologies. Examples, because I was asked to show some pictures. All right? So if you don't like red things, you can leave the room now. But this is an example of what a brain looks like after a stroke. So to give you oriented, the eyeballs over here and the ears over here. So the top of the head's up here is how I look at it. And this is the cystic component of bad brain uh, that you'll see. Here's a child with cortical dysplasia, but not hemimeg. And here the abnormality is on the temporal lobe. You can see this long area of cortical area that's wider than it should be. Again, the eyeball is here. Here we can still identify the sensory and motor cortex because it has its normal landmarks. Compare that to a child with hemimeg encephaly, and you've got to turn the head around. But this is a very abnormal piece of cortex in which you don't see much in the way of any normal anatomy that you can speak of. Um, here's an example of a child with Rasmussen syndrome, and you say, well, what do, is there to look at? If you kind of look, you see this patchy whiteness 
interspersed with areas that aren't so patchy white, and it's this patchiness that is the components of what constitutes the Rasmussen's uh, encephalitis. Uh, this is just an MR example of Sturge Weber, and for this is this uh, blood abnormalities, vascular abnormality on the surface, and that's what it looks like on the surface of the brain. This is an area of venous congestion and engorgement that you see over the course of the surface of the brain. And I believe, so just as a, to fill in those uh, information, so um, we're a little over the 200 mark, so the second series would be our series over 20 some years. Uh, and the reality is, is that the profile is not a whole lot different than the 2004 general survey. So again, not quite half uh, are some cortical dysgenesis. We were a little higher on the Rasmussen's, um, and if you then uh, just, so even over a 20-year period, the same profile is what we've seen in the 2004 survey. Now, rare etiologies. In the 2004 survey, there were four cases, like I said, of tuber sclerosis, even though there were tubers on the other side. One case of interventricular hemorrhage, one case of a history of trauma, one case of tumor. In our series, we have a, seem to be collecting a little bit more of the unusual types. Um, we've actually are up to four hemispherectomies for tumor. These were large enough tumors that basically the only way to cure their tumor was to take out half their brain. Uh, we've got uh, the trauma. We've got now several kids who've had a history of herpes encephalitis. Uh, two kids with Accardi syndrome, uh, neurofibromatosis, you can see. One that I classify as a surgical procedure at another facility that basically destroyed the hemisphere. And then some unusual things, Proteus syndrome, which is a thing where half the body is bigger than it should be, linear sebaceous, and we have one case in our series of hypomelanosis of Edo. And I believe that's it. Now the last thing I'll make a comment on, uh, just as, a, as, a, in, as interest, um, as part of the, having all your families together and the, the social stuff is, in addition to that, this is an opportunity sometimes for uh, uh, possibilities for some research interests. While it's late, we just this last week got approval from our UCLA Institutional Review Board to collect blood uh, for possible genetic studies. And if there are families that, so I need the, the child and their parents, and if anyone's interested in uh, uh, contributing to that, I'd like, well, hopefully if, if Monica's around, we can have, use one of the rooms, maybe during the lunchtime or a little bit afterwards as a way of, uh, of asking you to come. We have to sign a consent form, but we'd ask you to, to contribute. This would be for trying to identify. We've got a liaison with a physician at UC San Diego and doing genetic studies. And then there's some other studies with the Rasmussen's and non-Rasmussen's kids. We like to try in some mice work. So if you'd like to volunteer your families, then come and... Um, so, shall I open up to questions at this point? Yeah, Sue's or, Sue, or Sue's guy, I'm just saying. Sue's